Hi everyone, welcome to the September 1st edition of the Timeform US Pacecast. I'm David Aragon and I'll be joined very shortly by my co-host Craig Milkowski. Well, it's Kentucky Derby Week, finally here. It's been delayed by about four months, but they just drew the post positions for the race this morning, right before we actually were recording this. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Tis the law out in that number 17 post. A lot of people making much of this po- these post positions and the fact that the favorites are drawn towards the outside. We'll give our thoughts on that in a little bit. They also drew the Kentucky Oaks yesterday. That's obviously occurring on Friday. That entire card is out now. We'll talk about the Kentucky Oaks a little bit with Gamine and Swiss Skydiver, the two two major players in there. And then we'll do a little recap of last week's racing. Obviously, there are plenty of graded stakes at Saratoga. Those two grade ones on Saturday, the Turf Classic and the Ford Go, run in a torrential downpour. Uh, some unusual circumstances for those races, but they were able to get off and some noteworthy performances. And then we'll talk about the grade two Pat O'Brien, which they ran at Del Mar to close out the show. But Craig, I'm going to start off by talking about the Kentucky Derby. And it's been a long road to the Derby this year, but we actually have a field that's set as of this morning yeah it looks like we finally got here got 18 which frankly a couple months ago is more than i thought we would get uh uh, the post post straw was uh interesting i thought pretty much all of the bigger names drew outside which is probably what they wanted so i I don't think the post straw is really going to have any big impact on the race uh the long run to the first turn usually makes it uh not that big of a deal anyway sometimes if you have a speed horse on the inside and they don't break well they could get shuffled back but otherwise I, i don't think any of the posts are a problem yeah, I really do agree with that. People make a lot about the probabilities of certain post positions winning the races. Uh, there's apparently the curse of the number 17 post, which is what tis the law drew. Apparently no horse has ever won the Kentucky Derby from post position number 17, though I'm not really sure what that means now that they have a new starting gate, since all of the positions are going to be in a slightly different spot on the racetrack. Also, with the field of just 18 runners, I think the horse that's number 17 is actually breaking from gate number 18. So I don't think any of that stuff really matters it's fodder for people to discuss uh but i don't really view it as uh something something that should influence your handicapping uh i like that the horses drew the outside i think it's going to give them an unencumbered run into the first turn uh, unless somebody does something weird at the start which you can't really predict anyway Uh, i think you're less likely to have something unusual happen from one of the outside post positions where you have more of a clear run and more room to maneuver uh and i would imagine they're looking to get an outside run keeping Tis the Law in the clear anyway. That's the kind of trip that he's gotten in both the Belmont Stakes and the Travers. They just try to ride him like he's the best horse. And I imagine they'll do the same thing even in this larger field. Yeah, and, you know, I'll be honest, despite the big field, uh, I I still just don't think it's a very strong race with, with the unfortunate scratch of, uh, not scratch, he was never really entered, but withdrawal of Art Collector due to a minor injury. It sounds like it's not too bad. They, they think they could still make the Preakness in October, so hopefully the, the news will be good with him. But really, for me, uh, this race is just going to come down to Honor EP and Tis the Law. It, it's hard for me to see any of these other horses winning without just something really crazy happening where, where those two had terrible trips. Um, so I'm not sure it's going to offer a lot of value. They're sure to be the, the top two choices in the betting. I'm not sure how extreme it'll be on Tis the Law. I would think he's going to be even money or less, even with, with 18 horses in the field, giving his credentials, one we don't normally see for a Kentucky Derby because of being run so late. So as a fan, I'm looking forward to this race as a better, not so much, to be honest. No, that's totally fair. Uh, I think you can make the argument that this field – as large as it is, it's not that much tougher than the Travers that Tis the Law just won. Uh, in that race, he had a Bob Baffert challenger, some horses who had run some reasonably fast speed figures in a few prep races, and he easily handled them. Obviously, Honor AP has better credentials than some of the horses that coming into the Travers. He's a grade one winner in the Santa Anita Derby. He's run some speed figures that put him somewhere within range of Tis the Law if he takes a small step forward. Uh But once you get past those two, especially if you don't think Authentic is going to get the distance, which I know both of 
both you and I are a little bit skeptical about. There's just a lot of filler in this race, and it'll be interesting to see how the Preakness comes up after this. And obviously, we're getting ahead of ourselves because we haven't even run the Kentucky Derby yet. And the, our intention here is to discuss the Kentucky Derby a little bit. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how tough the Preakness comes up if Tis the Law does win the Derby. Because it feels like the Preakness, with some of the horses pointing to that, especially if our Collector recovers in time, that could be the toughest, uh, the toughest Triple Crown race of them all. Yeah, no kidding. It, it would certainly be a heck of a way to try to win a Triple Crown if Tis the Law would win, because he's certainly going to face a tougher field than what you would normally see in a Belmont Stakes. And given the mile and a half distance, a lot of horses tend to avoid that. But I, I don't think you're going to see that with, with the Preakness. But I mean, I don't want to discount some of the horses. There are some some very good horses in this field. I mean, New York Traffic's been solid. Uh, he hasn't won much at all. I, I don't think he's won since his first race of the year, if memory serves. Uh, but he's run well enough, but he, he's just not in the same league as Tis the Law from a speed figure perspective. You mentioned uh, Authentic, who I think is obviously a very good horse, but he's one who probably has distance limitations. Uh, he was barely able to hold off New York traffic in the Haskell, despite having things relatively easy up front so it, it opening up a big lead so for me it, it's hard to picture that he's going to relish the 10 furlongs and, and i guess the other horse that i should mention is king guillermo who who was running speed figures near the almost hit the 120 mark back in may it, it's kind of crazy to think he's been all four months just prepping from this race so i really don't know what we're going to get from him but expecting uh if you're going to bet him you have to expect that he's going to improve several lengths in that four month time frame we should talk a little bit about how the pace of this race might shape up and uh we put out a preliminary pace projector about a week ago uh and it does show authentic on the lead obviously art collector was predicted to be up there with him he's not in the race uh do you think they're going to send Authentic from this outside post position? It feels like they have to use him somewhat aggressively to get early position. I would imagine he'll want to cross over in front of those two other favorites. The other horses, though, that are shown in the pace projector to be up close to the pace are King Guillermo, as well as Storm the Court, uh, with perhaps even New York traffic up close. I would imagine it'll be a pretty competitive pace. I don't think this is going to be one of those derbies where somebody shakes loose on the front end through moderate fractions. No, I don't think so either. I think it'll be solid. I don't think anybody's going to go crazy and go out and we'll see a 45 half or anything like that because we just don't have that kind of runoff, really fast, super ho uh, super fast horse in the beginning. Another horse we didn't mention is Thousand Words. He's one that I wouldn't be surprised if he's right up there dueling for the lead. His best races have come when, it, when that's how he runs uh, in, in two-turn races. And he certainly seems to have come back into form. Now, whether he's good enough to contend with uh, Tis the Law, that, that's a different question. But I, I certainly think he'll be up there as well. And that's something where the pace projector kind of misses a little bit because we look at the last five races. And he was just all form. Uh, and he seems to have come into form. And when he's in form, he does show plenty early speed. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how those horses sort each other out because it does seem like there's a lot of uh, plodding closers down towards the inside with more of the speed drawn towards the outside. So we'll see how these horses cross over in the first quarter of a mile. I generally think, though, it's going to be a pretty fair run to the first turn. You've got a long way to go from the starting gate up until that clubhouse turn. And with this field of 18 and given the way the post positions struck out, I don't think there's going to be uh, the, the crush that we sometimes see in these races, especially with that new starting gate. I mean, as for some of the long shots that might be able to get into the mix, uh, I mean, we're just giving sort of sort of immediate reactions after the post positions are drawn. I haven't really done in-depth handicapping of the race yet. If there is plenty of pace, I wouldn't discount a horse like Max Player from hitting the board. Uh, like we were saying, it's not like this race has come up that much tougher than the Belmont Stakes and the Travers. Max Player has been taking a step forward with each and every start. Uh, do you give even a shot to horses like Money Moves, who is moving up out of Allowance Company? He's very lightly raced, but he has that same speed figure pattern where he's kind of trending upwards. Uh, I feel like a lot of these horses that showed, um, that basically earned their points back in the springtime, like like the Enforceables and the Finnick, the Fierces, the Major Feds. A lot of them have gone the wrong way since then, and they're just sort of in this race because they can be. And I'd be, I think, inclined to go more towards the horses that are doing well right now. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that, and I kind of dismiss this as a betting race. I was looking at it from a win perspective. If you find some prices underneath, we've certainly seen uh, derby payoffs where the favorite wins, and you can still get some huge payoffs if you can get some long shots underneath. And I would agree with you. I'm not interested in those horses like that Louisiana contingent that just was slow and Several of them have found their way into this derby. So I have no problem with anybody taking a look for a long shot. And Max Player, I'm not sure. I mean, he may be the third or fourth choice, to be honest. But he could run well, and I could certainly see him hitting the board. Yeah, I mean, even the horse that was the late addition to this race, South Bend, I mean, it seems like he's taken a step forward recently, was just fourth in the Travers. He'll be a huge price. I think a lot of these horses, the point I'm making is they can hit the board. And as you were alluding to, the way to play this race is probably looking at those exotics wagers, the trifectas, the superfectas. If you think it's pretty straightforward on top and you can find some long shots to throw in underneath, maybe that's the right strategy in this Kentucky Derby. Let's talk a little bit about the Kentucky Oaks, which was drawn yesterday, running on Friday. Uh, The two big names, Gamine and Swiss Skydiver. It'll be interesting to see how this race plays out in the early going, uh, with Swiss Skydiver drawing the rail, Gamine in post position number five, whether one of them wants to go take the bull by the horns to the other and lead this field in the early going. Uh, Maybe Swiss Skydiver's hand is forced a little bit by drawing the rail. Uh, Gamine has led in all of her starts. It's going to be a fascinating race to watch. And there are some other talented fillies in this race, like Speech and Donna Veloce, who should not be dismissed. Yeah, I would agree. I'm actually personally looking forward to this race as a fan, even a little more than the Derby, just to see how it plays out. I mean, we have two really good fillies in Swiss Skydiver and Gamine. Uh, As you mentioned, Speech has done very little wrong this year, only losing to Swiss Skydiver. Uh, Finishing a neck behind Gamine before getting put up for that that uh, positive that Bob Baffert had and, and looked really good in the Ashland last time. So I think this is a, a strong field and really this whole Friday card, there, there's a lot of stars on it and, and looking forward to this day just as much as Derby Day. No, I totally agree with that. And the Oaks, uh, it will be a fascinating race to watch. Again, it's not one that I've really done a lot of handicapping yet. Uh, I'm interested to see how Gamine handles the stretch out to a mile and an eighth. Uh, I, I wonder if they'll go on and take the lead with her. I would imagine Swiss Skydiver is going to get that aggressive ride since she's been so successful using those tactics in the past. And I don't think it's some kind of, I mean, I've seen a lot of people just conceding this race to Gamine, and I don't want to shortchange Swiss Skydiver, who's just got really good lately. She obviously handles this distance. Uh, I feel like she's a horse that I've underrated a lot in the past, and she's just gained my respect by continuing to improve with every start, and I think it's going to be a battle between these two horses. I don't think this is going to be some cakewalk for Gamine. No, I don't. As you saw yesterday, yeah, Time Form US, we took some grief from the the Gamine diehards out there because she's not shown in front on the pace projector. But if you look at her pace figures, I mean, it's not even close, really. A Swiss Skydiver's just been running a lot faster in her races. That doesn't mean that Gamine can't run faster, but we can't, you know, we're not soothsayers. We can't look forward and use numbers that don't exist. And the pace projector is nothing but an algorithm. And if Gamine is going to make the lead, she's going to have to work for it. Because I'm with you. If I'm riding Swiss Skydiver, I, I think you got to go. I, I don't think you want to sit and possibly get shuffled back. You have pretty fast horse, a uh, couple stalls over, and Donna Veloce, who, who's coming off a long layoff, but certainly has some talent. And I don't think you just want to cede the lead to Gamine and, and then have to move out and try to pass her late. So uh, I think it's going to be a super interesting race. I think the jockeys are going to play a hand in the outcome, and I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. A lot a lot of other people seem to. And I don't think it's a foregone conclusion those two are going to win. I mean, as I mentioned, speech has been very good. She's more tractable, can raid off the pace. So if things get too hot, I don't see a reason she couldn't win this race either. Yeah, obviously some people were quibbling with that pace projector, which I understand. Gamine has been so impressive and so fast in her races, and she's never had another horse in front of her really at any point in her races. Uh, So the pace projector might seem a little bit surprising. The point that it's trying to make, though, is when you look at Gamine's prior races, her fraction in the test last time to the half, 45 flat, obviously 
that's faster than the 47 and four to the half that Swiss Skydiver ran in the Alabama. It's a different day, so you can't compare one to the other. And they're different distances, so you can't really compare one to the other. And that's the beauty of pace figures, is they tell you how fast that fraction was relative to the final time. And the thing about Gamine is, as impressive as she's been, she has set slow paces relative to the final times that she's been running. And those final times have been spectacular, but she's done it with pretty favorable setups. Now, part of that is because she just makes her own good trips because she's so naturally fast and so sharp from the gate. But she hasn't really had to run one of these stamina sapping races where she goes fast every step of the way over a longer distance, whereas Swiss Skydiver has done that in many of her prior races. And that's why she's shown forward on the pace projector and Gamine is just behind her because the pace projector has to take into account how fast horses have run relative to their final times in the past, and Gamine has never really taken herself out of her game to go fast early and then make herself finish late. We'll see if Swiss Skydiver forces her to do that. But I agree with you. Uh, Speech and Do Donna Veloce are interesting horses. Obviously, it's a big ask for Donna Veloce in particular because she's coming off that long layoff, but it's easy to forget how impressive she was last year as a two-year-old, and she was, at that time, considered to be the one with the most upside of all. Obviously, a lot of the rivals she was facing then have fallen away, uh, but she easily beat Speech last time, and that's Santa Isabel, and it appears that she's trading well into this race. I'm not saying that she's going to upset the top two, but uh, she's pretty talented, and there is more depth to this race, arguably, than the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, I do want to mention one thing about Swiss Skydiver. We're, we're talking about Gamine and horses who who haven't really shown a lot of speed. Uh, and she was actually that kind of horse uh, when she won the uh, the Gulfstream Park Oaks. She had never really run particularly fast. She set slow fractions that day. But she's a horse that proved that when she had to go faster, she could. At least since that day, she's done nothing but run fast early and late. But, you know, so I'm just pointing out that just because a horse hasn't run fast don't mean they can't like a mean. But a horse who's going to be odds on, you know, I'll probably take a shot against her. We'll see. Uh, I've, I'm sure we'll do some stuff with our uh, Timeform US package and, and we'll tweet some things out as the race gets closer. But as I mentioned earlier, there's no way I'm just seeding the race to Gamine because I, I don't think she has the kind of edge on this field that the odds are going to pretend she does. All right, let's move back to last week and do a little recap of some of the stakes racing, uh, beginning at Saratoga, where we saw some grade one action on Saturday and the Turf Classic and the Forgo. Obviously, both of these races were somewhat affected, well, more than somewhat, were very affected by the turf condition and the condition of the main track as there was a little bit rain early in the morning, then it just started pouring in the afternoon and they were able to keep the both turf ra stakes races on the turf, but they were run over boggy conditions, the kind of which we rarely see in this country, especially by the time we got to the Sword Dancer. And uh, Channel Maker got the job done, got to the front end, got the same kind of trip that he got in that 2018 Turf Classic a couple of years ago, and he just relished the conditions as he's done in the past, and really nobody was able to get close to him at any point in this race. You could tell coming down the stretch for the first time that he was probably going to win. Yeah, it was an interesting uh, course, obviously, with the just downpours a couple of times during the day. And as you said, once he made the lead, I mean, the race looked pretty much over. I uh, had flashbacks to his uh, hot streak a couple years ago, and he backed it up. And it, it just shows as handicappers, you, you have to stay on your toes. Uh, he's a horse who, for the most part, has always loved a, a course with a lot of give in it. He got that. His rider took full advantage, and, and it was uh, really just a strong effort. Now, that said, I'm not sure what it means going forward. He he got a 130 time form U.S. speed figure, which is, I think, his best, but it's right there with what he's run on other soft tour, uh, turf conditions when he's uh, had his A race. So, I mean, all I can say is if he gets the same kind of course and doesn't get challenged, he's probably going to run the same thing. But outside of that, I, I don't know how much, figure, how much uh, utility that figure or the others we talk about are going to have, but... I have to make them. We still saw some good performances. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those tricky things you have to deal with as a handicapper when these horses run back. 
Yeah, it's funny. Sometimes these boggy turf courses, the races almost play out more like dirt races than turf races because it's no sprint to the finish. It turns into a real test of stamina over these longer distances. And Channel Maker was just able to churn out those pretty uh, steady fractions for the entire race. And a horse like Sadler's Joy or even Aquaphobia, runners that typically unleash a nice turn of foot at the end of their races, they were just spinning their wheels by the time they got to the 3 eighths pole and they really couldn't make up any ground. It was just kind of a merry-go-round race behind Channel Maker, some of the horses that were chasing him like Marzo faded away, but even those that passed horses, it's not really because they were uh, picking up the pace, they were just sort of staying on at one pace and they really couldn't make up any ground on the leader. It's kind of like how dirt racing plays out in these longer races quite a bit, and as you said, I don't think that this uh, speed figure for Channel Maker has a whole lot of handicap and utility moving forward, especially if he runs on a, a firm turf course once again, because we know who Channel Maker is, and running on a firm turf course, he's not the kind of horse that's going to draw and win by six lengths. He's just one of these horses that loves boggy ground, and we'll see if that hap that he gets that at another point in his career before he's retired, uh, but uh, he's definitely uh, a nice horse, and it was, it was gratifying to see him get back to the winner's circle, because both he and Sadler's Joy are kind of the old guard of this division if they've been good for so long. So uh, it's just nice to see a horse like him pick up another grade one victory. Yeah, and last point on this race for me, uh, I was actually surprised when I sat down to make the figures after watching the card. We do the uh, track condition ratings. I, I thought this was going to be a really low one down like one or two, something like that. But it was actually a five. I guess the course has been so firm that even that huge amount of rain didn't make it quite as slow as what I thought it would be. No, it's funny you say that because I was sure they were going to take all the turf races off on Sunday because they had gotten so much rain on Saturday. I just couldn't imagine how they could have run over that course after the way it looked in the Sword Dancer. Uh, but they were able to get in two turf races on Sunday, so apparently it wasn't quite as wet as maybe we thought. Uh, but still, it definitely affected the outcome of this race, as well as the Saranac, which we're going to get to in a little bit. But first, let's discuss the other grade one race on Saturday at Saratoga. That was the Forgo run right before the Sword Dancer. And once again, maybe um, the, the sloppy track didn't cause the big gaps between runners like we saw in the Sword Dancer, but it definitely made for a fun race to watch and win-win-win, uh, just completely lost contact with the field in the early going. And uh, we saw that Speed was doing pretty well on the main track in the races coming up to this forego, and uh, especially horses down towards the inside seemed to have a bit of an advantage. And the pace of this race was pretty competitive. It didn't seem like it would be on paper, or at least in the pace projector coming up to this race, but a number of horses went forward. Complexity ended up getting a slight lead over True Timber. They were dead tired coming to the wire, and Win 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 just was able to swallow them up in the late stages. Yeah, this is one of the crazier races you see uh, if by any chance our, any of our listeners haven't seen it it's definitely worth a watch and particularly if you have access to the head-on to watch that because it is quite the uh, the trip to see that from that head-on view and see the kind of run this horse makes uh, it, it's one just eye-catching and honestly watching the race live as they were coming into the stretch I was pretty sure he was going to win that's how much faster he was moving than everyone else. I mean, he just looked like a flash compared to everybody else that was tiring. Uh, it was pretty quick pace figures, as you mentioned. There wasn't a whole lot of speed on paper coming in, but apparently a lot of trainers saw that or riders saw that and decided they were going to be the speed. And as happened sometimes, it wound up being kind of a speed duel up front. And we had the half mile in red, and the race just kind of fell apart. Now, because of that, the two three finishers both got better time form U.S. speed figures than the winner. Win, win, win got a 117. And then a pretty big jump up to the next two at 123 each. Uh, that said, as I had mentioned on the forecast, I, I still am not buying that this is really a grade one race. I know it, it was in, in name. But the PP's coming in and the performance is going out. It, it's just not real. These are not the top sprinters in the country. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. I mean, these were this race was missing Volatile, who I don't think was ever pointing to this race. They they kind of wanted to keep him a little shorter. And Vacoma, who was supposed to run here, had a minor setback, so he didn't get to participate. And when you're missing two big stars like that in the division, obviously it's not uh, the, the championship-level race that we were hoping for, but it did generate a pretty competitive field because of that. And it certainly played out as an exciting race with an evenly matched group of runners, like you said, win-win wins performance. It's really 
really something to behold. Uh, it reminded me almost of that race where Honor Code broke his maiden as a two-year-old a number of years ago, where he just completely lost contact with the field in the slop, and then as they came to the top of the stretch, he still had so much ground to make up, but you could see him moving at the back of the pack, just like with Win Win Win. You could see that chiclet swing to the outside, moving at a different rate than everybody else on the bottom of the screen, and uh, he was just able to carry that momentum forward to get the job done. I do want to give credit to Complexity and True Timber, who, as you said, they earned the highest time formula speed figures in this race. They really just slugged it out on the front end the entire way and were pretty game to just miss at the end of this race. Kind of feel bad for Complexity, who I know has had a bunch of problems. He's been hard to keep on the track at times, hard to keep in top form, and Chad Brown was able to get him back to that grade one winning form we saw from him in the Champagne as a two-year-old. Uh, looked like he might have this victory wrapped up at the 16th pole, but Win 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 just got him in the late stage is pretty competitive field. I mean, bunched up at the end, even a horse like Funny Guy ran well coming out of those New York bred races. We'll see if these horses can be competitive in grade one sprints moving forward. It could be tough for them, but it was definitely a fun race to watch. And sticking with those sprinters, we saw the fastest winning performance on the dirt on Saturday come from Yopon in the grade two Amsterdam. Uh, field of three-year-olds and this horse is lightly raced. Uh, this was just his third career start coming out of a maiden and allowance victory, and he's just taken a significant step forward with each successive start. And this was something pretty special, and it seems like Steve Askerson has yet another very good sprinter on his hands. Yeah, I mean, as good a trainer as, as he is at basically anything on dirt, especially sprinters sure seem to be his specialty with some of the ones we've seen recently, Matoli, um, Volatile, who you mentioned earlier, and now Yapon. Uh, this was a big effort. I mean, we do have to put an asterisk, I guess, by it because of the really sloppy conditions. He went wire to wire on an un uncontested lead, but this one at least ran pretty quick early. Uh, he didn't just get handed the lead. He opened up. It was a 131 early pace figure, and nobody could make up an inch on him late. And it's kind of hard to say. I think at that point, maybe people were thinking the track was just a conveyor belt. And of course, it's always possible it changed given the conditions. But we saw that you could come from behind later on the card, as some horses did, and, and particularly win, win, win. So I'm not sure what to make of this effort, but I, I'm confident in saying that he's a very, very good horse. I also think Basin ran a good race in defeat. Uh, as we surmised on the uh, forecast, he may very well just be better at one turn, particularly if maybe he would even do better at seven furlongs to a one turn mile. Six furlongs might have been a little short, but he was very game in defeat. I thought he ran well. And even Premier Star, the third place finisher, uh, I thought he backed up that big race at Laurel. Uh, it didn't look like he liked the kickback very much. He wound up being wide, lost a lot of ground, but I thought he still ran very well, too. Yeah, I, I did think it helped that Yopom was able to get loose on the front end, something that didn't necessarily, that we didn't necessarily predict before the race based on how it looked on paper. Uh, Premier Star, uh, he didn't have, he didn't stumble at the start or anything. He was just off a little bit flat-footed in the slop and, and never really got to show the speed that we had seen from him in the past. And long weekend, I think we can say at this point, he just does not like these kind of conditions because he did not seem like the same horse that we saw early in the year in this race or even in the gold fever prior to this. He just doesn't seem like he's a horse that really acts on very wet ground. And that allowed Yopon to basically control things up front. He set a legitimate pace, though. I mean, I don't want to say that his victory was illegitimate by any means. Uh, he just dominated this race, and he's got that versatility where he can come from just off the pace or be on the lead, and that's a real feather in his cap moving forward. Uh, he was just best at the end of the day. I will point out that the horses who finished first and second, they did ride the rail the entire way, and coming up to at least this race on the card, it seemed like the rail was where you wanted to be, or it was a slight advantage. Uh, that might have changed by the time we got to the Carter, because obviously a ton of rain fell between the Amsterdam and the Carter, they really rushed the horses to the gate. Not the car to the forego. I keep getting these grade one races mixed up. Uh, it seemed like they really rushed the horses from the gate from the Amsterdam to the forego. So I don't know if it was the exact same racetrack that these two great uh, graded stakes were run over. Uh, but uh, again, take nothing away from Yao Pan's victory. He was just really impressive. And the sky seems like it's the limit for him. Yeah, and what you mentioned, it, it's really good to keep notes on, on days like this. As you mentioned, it rained again just before the four go. So it is very possible the track changes, I mentioned. But I'm with you. Uh, you 
<laughs> How did you say that again? Yopon, right? <laughs> I believe it's Yopon, or that's what yeah, I, I think you're that's right. what they were saying. On the I said show. it completely. I completely butchered it the first time I said it, but yeah, it's Yopon. Uh, take nothing away from him. The horses run three times. He's looked very professional, as you said. He's done it in lots of different ways. He handled fast track and off track, so he's obviously a star in the making. All right, already I've called the Sword Dancer the Turf Classic and the Forgo the Carter. I believe the name of the first turf stakes they ran on Saturday was the Saradac. I'll try not to get these mixed up moving forward. Uh, the third race of the day at Saratoga was the Saradac uh, going a mile. And this must have been uh, a slightly frustrating decision for you as the speed figure maker uh, for them to move this race from the inner turf course to the melon turf course where... I believe this was the first time they ever ran a one-mile race on the Melon Turf course. There was basically no run-up to the first turn because the, the circumference of the Melon Turf course is exactly a mile. Uh, so that was a new situation for making a speed figure for it. Again, though, like the Turf Classic, this was a race that was really affected by the turf condition. Yeah, and this is a race. So believe it or not, these kind of things don't bother me. I mean, stuff happens. The track did what they have to do. Uh, and, and they told us they were upfront about what was happening. Uh, they, they posted some fractions during the race, which were just ridiculous and obviously wrong. So the chart maker was sharp enough to just say those can't be right and remove them. So the figures you're going to see for this race are basically just kind of time form style where they're more class ratings based on what the horses have run coming in because the times are, are virtually meaningless. So in the end, the top two wound up getting 111s, which kind of fit what they've been running. And, and the whole field basically ran similar to what they have. And it was just kind of how the trips worked out. Uh, bye bye, Melvin. He it was a weird race to watch because watching as they were turning into the stretch, uh, lead on the turn, I should say, he looked like he was packing it in and was done. And I thought Don Juan Kitten was home free. And somehow he just kind of found some new strength and came kicking on and was able to get up late. Really weird race. But and again, another that I don't think it's going to mean a whole lot going forward unless these horses just run on a bog again. But good effort by him. I didn't see it coming, but. Good to see the Monmouth horses run well, I guess. Yeah, it's just a great example of how much stamina seems to really matter in these races. It was only going a mile. Don Juan Kitten seemed like he had it just wrapped up at the 16th pole, but he really shortened stride at the end. And Bye Bye Melvin just kept plugging away at him and finally nipped him on the wire. It does seem like these progeny of Uncle Mo just love this boggy going whenever they get to run over it. I think I remember when they had those really boggy days at Pimlico for one of those Preakness stakes a couple of years ago. Uh, there are a couple of progeny of Uncle Mo who just seemed to love that going. And uh, Bye Bye Melvin certainly didn't mind it here. Uh, there were clearly some horses that just couldn't handle the going at all, like Vanzi, who was done basically halfway through the race. That Chad Brown import, Limperator, who uh, I guess a lot of people were assuming was going to handle it because he did so over in Europe. He didn't handle the American-style bog at all. Uh, he was a short price in this race and didn't show up. But again, it's the kind of race that I just wouldn't put too much stock in from a handicapping standpoint. No, and I'm the kind of guy that's usually leery just to dismiss bad races because of track condition. But this is a case where this turf race and the other later on the Carter ones, why I will certainly just put a line through bad performances and even good performances and pretend they didn't happen when I handicapped them. Speaking of good performances, we saw one of those in the stakes race on Sunday, the grade three Shuvi, which uh, was won on the front end by Latriska. I know you love performances like this. Joel Rosario, who was on her, just took no prisoners on the front end, really sent her through fractions that would be out of the comfort zone for most front runners, but had confidence in this filly that she could go fast every step of the way. And it was just a tour de force performance. She only won by a length, but she was more than a length the best in this race. Yeah, that was some performance. I, I was wide. I was kind of anticipating it going in, and I just loved watching it. If we were able to be at Saratoga this year, I, I think I would have went and gave Joel Rosario a big hug, maybe even a kiss on the cheek, for riding a speed horse the way they're supposed to be ridden. It was really the only way Latruska was going to win this race, just take it to him early. And you could see the closers had their sap just their kick just totally sapped. They they couldn't make up ground despite her noticeably slowing late. And personally, that's what I like to see. It works more often than not. And 
when it doesn't work, it, it's not like the alternative is, is a better option where you just go slow and try to keep all the other horses in the race and outkick them late. Latruska is not going to outkick very many horses late. So I just thought it was a perfect ride. She, she got a nice figure, a 123, which was boosted from the 116 final time because of that pace with all the fractions in red. And you just love to see it. We had talked about it uh, after the test when we recapped that. Maybe she's a horse who one turn, uh, that one turn sprint, or not the test, that, that's the three or the ballerina, the ballerina, I guess yeah. it was, right. Hey, I'm catching up to you, David, on those. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just the kind of race I love. Big pass, just go fast and make them beat you. And if they can't, so be it. And if they do, shake it off and come back another day. Because I love when horses use their weapons, and that's what happened here. I completely agree with that. It was just a fun to watch this performance, especially from that second to third quarter mile when he just really put the, the pedal to the metal and opened up on that field to go 109 and two for the, the six furlong mark. Uh, that just really took everybody off their game. And it was a way to beat her main rivals because two of her biggest competitors in this race were Golden Award and <laughs> Nona Madeline, who had run this distance before in the summer colony, basically uh, up front the entire way. And Latruska took both of them out of their best game by making them come off the bridle very early, having to chase her, and they both faded in the late stages, and Latruska just kept going until the very end when, as you said, she did shorten stride but had enough left to hold on. Royal Flag, who was second, I mean, she had everything her own way, really had no excuse. I thought Javier Castellano gave her a great ride, and she got there and just couldn't quite press past Latruska in the late stages. I do want to mention that the third-place finisher, our super freak, she was the one that I think ran sneaky well in defeat because she had the most to prove coming in, having earned just that one big speed figure in the Molly Pitcher the last time. And I know there was some doubt about that Molly Pitcher speed figure because it seemed almost too high to be true for a couple of horses, including the winner Horologist. Uh, but uh, our Super Freak came back and more than validated that number. And Horologist is running uh, on Friday in that La Troyenne against Monomoy Girl. So be aware of that, that she ran a legitimate speed figure last time. Let's wrap up that Saratoga action with just one t two-year-old maiden performance. Uh, like to highlight some of these on the show, and we saw a good one on Saturday's card uh, in the race, actually right before the Amsterdam. Chad Brown uh, sent out Founder uh, to win pretty impressively, much like Win Win Win, although not quite as professional as that horse, coming from the back of the pack to get up to win over his uncoupled stable made highly motivated. It seems like both of these horses have big futures for Chad. Yeah, this was a good race. I will mention this was uh, one of the tougher figures to make on the card. Uh, it was obviously during that rainy card on, on Saturday, and the track did change a little bit, in my opinion. And this was kind of the swing race. So it's actually very possible this race could have went in one direction or the other, and it could have actually been about five or six points faster. But I, I chose to err on the side of caution, particularly given the trip. I mean, if I boosted the 98 figure up another six points, given the way he ran, I mean, it, it just it, it was probably a 60-40 call. It, it could have went either way, but it's definitely one that will be noted with a code in the uh, Timeform USPPs. So keep in mind that this may have even been a better effort than look, but regardless of what the number was, I think it was a strong effort. And with any more uh, professionalism from this horse going forward, he's going to be the, the real deal. Yeah, we haven't seen too many of the progeny of Upstart, but Chad Brown has sent out two impressive uh, sons of his at this meet, both Reinvestment Risk and now this horse Founder. I will say this is one of those races that kind of leads you to believe that the rail got very good, at least towards the middle of the card at Saratoga before that downpour prior to the forego, uh, because the top three finishers all rode the rail, basically for the entirety of the far turn. Founder wound up in the middle of the track at the end of this race, but he really started of that slingshot move into contention on the rail following highly motivated there uh so i still think these horses all ran excellent races and even new bomb who was third who set that fast pace and just missed at the end he's one to look for next time out as well but do keep in mind that they may have benefited slightly from the way the track was playing 
Yeah, that kind of went into my uh, thinking for the figure. But just to, to further that point, I mean, not a single horse in this field had ever run again. So it was just kind of had to use my, my experience to figure out which way I wanted to go. And in those cases, I'm generally going to go to the, the conservative way. Uh, it would be easy to watch the trip of the winner and say he could run better. So I, I don't want to give a, a figure that I think there's a good chance is too high. That's why I went with the lower 98. Let's wrap things up out at Del Mar to talk about that one graded stakes they ran last Saturday. It was the Pat O'Brien grade two event. And we had some familiar names from this California sprint division in action, like Flagstaff, especially also law abiding citizen, giant expectations coming off a layoff. But it was one of the newer faces, or I guess you could say a new older face in CZ Rocket who got the job done. Seems like he's a new horse that's being put into the Peter Miller barn. Uh, but he did have have plenty of back class and it just seems like Peter Miller has gotten him back to being the kind of horse that he was when he was younger as a four-year-old. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure thinking about it that we talked about his last race at Keeneland on the show where he just had a terrible start in the race and he, he still won like a one to nine shot. So I actually tuned in to, to Del Mar late after having shut things down for a little while after the big day at Saratoga just to bet CZ Rocket. But to show you how tough this game is, the, the betters weren't fooled. I think he was 6-5 to five when I t- tuned in, wound up going off 6-5 to five or so, 7-5. to five. I forget what it was exactly. So I didn't wind up betting the race. But just a, another good, solid performance from him. That said, from a speed figure perspective, it, it wasn't anything to write home about. The pace was pretty slow, and that could uh, have had an effect. Flagstaff ran his usual race that he always does in the mid to upper one teens. We've talked about him countless times because he, he just seems to run a lot, and he's always seems to be in good form. He's just not really a grade one horse. So I, I'm not sure CZ Rocket is at this point. I suspect he could run in the 120s, but I'm just not sure. And uh, I'm not sure if we'll see these horses again before the Breeders' Cup. But at this point, I I don't know that I'd want any of them against uh, a horse like Volatile or or Vacoma if he goes in that direction. I would imagine he's leaning dirt mile. But it'll be interesting to see where all these horses show up. And it's kind of funny talking about it, how many of these will actually not run again at this point until the Breeders' Cup. Yeah, no, many of them could be coming off slight layoffs. We'll see. It's not that far away. It seems weird to talk about the Breeders' Cup because in the same show, we're mentioning the Kentucky Derby upcoming this weekend, but that's the world we're living in right now. I agree with you. This was not the toughest sprint stakes we've seen. I just haven't been that thrilled with the top sprinters we've seen in California for the entirety of the summer. I mean, Law Abiding Citizen arguably ran one of the better races in that... um, the the Bing Crosby behind uh, Collusion Illusion who won that race because he was in the teeth of that fast pace. Uh, he kind of was disappointing here. He got the kind of slow pace that would have been beneficial to a horse that was setting the pace and just really had no answer to Flagstaff, who, as you said, just hasn't really taken that step forward, even though he's always there at the end and he's consistent. And CZ Rocket, who won the race, it's not like he had to improve that much off his allowance races, and he didn't. Uh, he was just better than the horses he was facing here. I don't know if I'd want him moving forward into a tougher spot, like you said, uh, but he's definitely back in top form. Because I remember this horse, I think he was one of the favorites, if not like the, the third or fourth choice in the forego at Saratoga two years ago when Whitmore won it. Uh, that was back when he was in Al Stahl's barn. So he's been a good horse for a long time, just kind of went through a slump for a while, and just Peter Miller has him back in top form right now. Yeah, he came into the Malibu in his three-year-old season undefeated and went off 5-2. to two. He went off 5-1 to one in that forego you're talking about. So he certainly uh, seems to have had a renaissance and, and – is one of the he's certainly the best sprinter if they keep him out west now uh peter miller seems to be shipping around a lot more these days picking his spot so uh with with you know things are a little tougher in california they're not running the the same quality of races but he certainly found an easy spot there and it'll be curious to see where he shows up next 
I agree with that. Well, that's all of the racing for this week. Uh, and that's also going to be all of our podcasting for this week. We're not going to do a show this Friday. Uh, just a lot going on with the Kentucky Oaks and the Kentucky Derby. Uh, so we'll do a recap show next week when we do the page cast to look back at all of these races from this upcoming weekend. Uh, but you can catch uh, our analysis uh, on DRF.com. I know we're both contributing to uh, the Timeform US Kentucky Derby package. I'll be doing betting strategies for Churchill down Saturday. Saturday card with Marcus Hirsch. So you can find information about that on either of our Twitter pages or on DRF.com. Uh, but good luck this weekend if you're playing the Kentucky Derby and Kentucky Oaks and looking forward to talking about these races after the run with you, Craig, next week. Remember, you can always listen to us on DRF.com, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud. Wherever you get your podcast, just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Forum channel. Thanks for listening this week, and we'll be back with the Time Form US Pacecast next Tuesday.